Hey, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Alex Wiggins, and I'm the CEO of the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority. Thank you so much for joining our panel discussion today as we celebrate Women's History Month. Um, we have an incredible panel of iconic leaders and um, innovators in transit. Um, we have Grace Kronikin, we have Carolyn Flowers, and we have Lona Hankins, and I'll talk a little bit about them in, in a few minutes. But our industry has really been impacted uh, by these three incredible leaders um, and really folks that know everything from what's happening on the, the maintenance yard to engineering, to executive leadership, to getting things done in the boardroom. And so I look forward to learning and I hope you uh, find this panel discussion to be, to be quite informative. Uh, so the first panelist I'd like to introduce is uh, Grace Krennikin. Um, I had the pleasure of working for Grace uh, just over a decade ago. Hey, Grace. And, um, you know, Grace actually gave me my first executive job in, in transportation. And what I remember about working for Grace is as we were managing the oversight of a, a large light rail construction project, Grace really empowered me to actually champion equity. She was actually the first executive that demanded equity in everything that we did, how we treated businesses, how we treated folks that were impacted by construction. And uh, those lessons, uh, I, I, I actually manage by them today. Uh, so just a little bit about Grace. Uh, most recently, she was the general manager at BART, uh, the Bay Area Rapid Transit, um, in, uh, located in the Bay Area in Oakland, California. Uh, prior to that, she was the director of the Seattle Department of Transportation. She's also been the director of the Oregon Department of Transportation, a deputy administrator with the Federal Transit Administration, and, um, and most recently um, has formed her own uh, consulting firm uh, called Krennikan LLC. And Grace is also an author and uh, recently published a book called uh, Boots on the Ground. So Grace, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we're really uh, fortunate to have you. Uh, the next panelist we have, you know, I like to say uh, with Car about Carolyn Flowers is actually stood on her shoulders at LA Metro. Uh, Carolyn Flowers uh, was uh, a former acting administrator of the FTA the CEO of the Charlotte Area Transit System. But where I first um, learned about Carolyn was in her role as Chief Operating Officer at the LA County Metro uh, Transit Authority. Um, you know, we shared a responsibility for managing the law enforcement operation. And Carolyn really laid the groundwork for accountability um, to ensure that folks were treated with respect and dignity. And we were able to build a transit policing operation where all were respected. And so I, I think that my success at LA Metro had a lot to do with the foundation that, that Carolyn laid. Um, Carolyn is also a member of the APTA Board of Directors and currently works as the uh, Managing Principal and Partner at InfraStrategies. And so Carolyn, thank you uh, so much for joining us and uh, we really appreciate your, your participation today. And the next panelist is uh, Lona Hankins. And uh, Lona and I met uh, about a year and a half ago um, at, a, at a business meeting. And um, I was really trying to recruit an engineer to head up our infrastructure and planning department. And I shared with the group, you know, what I was looking for. And uh, at the very end of the presentation, Lona came up to me like, okay, here's what you really need. And here's what you really need to do. And uh, from that conversation, we had some follow-ups and we were lucky enough to recruit Lona to join the staff at the RTA. Um, what's really special about Lona and what she brings to the RTA is her actual commitment to justice, to equity, to fairness. Um, and I can say this literally, I can't look more than a half mile in any direction of the city and not see Lona's impact. Um, she spent 20 years um, in engineering, um, in the oil and gas industry, uh, but she took those talents to actually help to rebuild the New Orleans public schools uh, following Katrina and, uh, and managing over $2 billion in, in projects. And so uh, Lona brings the type of dedication and passion to the RTA that we need to make sure that we can provide equitable transit um, across the entire uh, region. So um, I'm gonna keep it short there. Today, our panel is gonna be moderated by Elizabeth Stanikoff, who is a member of our um, senior, uh, who's a senior member of our uh, research and development team and uh, an up and coming leader in transportation. And uh, so let's get started. And uh, let's go to Grace, if you would share a little bit about yourself and uh, we'll start this discussion. Um, Alex, I think you covered a lot of that. I started uh, 
when I went to graduate school, uh, or I, I think when I was in high school, I, I got to be an intern at Mayor Goldschmidt's office. So Portland mayor, uh, they were putting in the transit model and I took citizen complaints as a volunteer in the mayor's office and just got excited about what I was doing. And I kind of tailored my education uh, in public administration and got an MBA. And then I, I was in an intern program called the president was called the presidential management internship program at the time. And they were trying to inject women and people of color in the federal government and give them a chance to rotate around. And so I took that opportunity. I was fortunate to have that. And between the two internships, um, they really opened my eyes to what was possible. I took one in transportation. Um, and so I, I've been at this for a long time. And I think that um, you know, as I look on the end of my career, the thing that um, I did with a bunch of other women that were there <clears throat> is just kind of help other people up the ladder as we were trying to go ourselves and create opportunities. I, I really think, you know, as you do, your, you want to be technically competent and all that, and hopefully everyone listening is, but um, as you create opportunities for everyone else, you meet new people and that opens your eyes to what talent is out there. And then they help you, you help them and off we go. And I'd like to leave it at that for now. Great. Thank you so much, Grace. <laughs> Carolyn, thank you for joining us today. And would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Well, um, like Grace, I actually started out on a progression to go into corporate America with an MBA um, in finance and marketing. But um, I was working for a company that went uh, chapter seven while I was trying to sell a document imaging system, old technology, to um, the predecessor agency to LA Metro. And um, I decided that uh, I needed to sell myself. I needed a job. And I ended up uh, going into LA Metro, starting out in civil rights and DBE. Um, and I ended up, um, they found out I had the finance background and moved into the budgeting department and you know, supported operations and uh, found my passion in public transit. And um, you know, thank you for the accolades around you know, security because that's one of the major issues um, and cost drivers in public transportation. Um, but I ended up, you know, moving from LA to Charlotte to Washington DC and in all of the positions I had a chance on the public and private side to advocate for advancement of public transportation in this country and it's still a passion uh, that I have. Great. So thank you again and we're just really happy to have you on, on the panel today. And uh, so next Lona if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit about yourself. Yeah good morning. Um, Carolyn used the word passion. Um, I like to say using your superpowers for good. Um, so I've been in transit for only 16 months, but I will say that I'm truly enjoying this journey. And what I'm enjoying most about it is um, the ability to bring my experience from other sectors to transit, to um, particularly to the RTA, to some level of efficiency and um, also to uh, improve the transit for the citizens of New Orleans. I'm most excited about um, the ability to drive the delivery of infrastructure improvements that are commonplace everywhere else, but have not reached New Orleans yet. yet. So I'm really excited about to, to drive what is normal everywhere else, um, just bring it home to New Orleans. Great, great, thank you so much. And again, we're ecstatic that you, you joined our team and we know we've got some really fantastic capital projects that are in a pipeline that will be delivered soon. Uh, so I'm gonna sign off now. I'm gonna hand off to Elizabeth Stanikoff who is going to guide us through this discussion. And again, Elizabeth, thank you. You know, Elizabeth joined the RTA about a year ago and definitely is uh, definitely certainly an up and coming leader and innovator um, in transit. So we're lucky to have you and it's all yours. All right, thank you, Alex. Um, thank you everybody for coming. So I'm gonna lead a little Q&A here. Um, so each of these questions is gonna be directed to one panelist, but if anybody else has anything to chime in, by all means. Um, so our first question is for Grace. Um, and so 
could you talk a little bit about obstacles that you faced within your career um, and then how you overcame those obstacles to set yourself up for success? Um, I don't know that I would call them obstacles, but um, er many times when I took a job, I was the only woman um, and there were no people of color when I got started in leadership posts. Um, so if you, <clears throat> at whatever level you were at, you were the only woman in the room. Um, I had, I've had people kind of dish you an elbow um, uh, now and again, um, men and women. It's not particular to the gender. Um, and uh, all you need to do is just stop looking at, at failure or roadblocks as that. And they're just problems that you keep working. Uh, I call it working the deal. Uh, I'm not referencing any old presidents you might think of, but um, just as you go through life, um, it, as you take issues to understand how the obstacles work, how the people around you work, how the systems work that you're dealing with, and, and what you can do to move around them. Um, I use a network all the time. Uh, many of us are members of the Women's Transportation Seminar. Um, I was president of that organization way back in 88 or something like that, the national organization. But, and by being president, it just exposed me. I was so fortunate at such a young age to get to know, you know 20 different chapters at the time around the country and, and to use those folks to help think things through. So um, when I think about obstacles, I just think about them as the issues of the day. Uh, the good news is for any of you that are managers out there is that there are problems in the world. If there weren't any problems, they wouldn't need us managers, right? So uh, it's, just, it's just problem solving is all it is. And that's the way to think about it. If you run into somebody SOB who doesn't, you know, think you belong where you are, you do the job for a while and maybe you find another job if this person's gonna stay and, and can't open their eyes, but um, doing a good job at what's there, someone will notice that and you have that on your resume to do. And if the smart thing career-wise to do is get out of there and go do something else, you can do that. Um, but you can also um, you know, show that you can do the job and other people are noticing. Um, even if you think they're not, um, and they are there as a reference, you can always give the reference to somebody else who can say that so-and-so listed that as his accomplishment, but really, you know, Lona was there to deliver the project, that kind of thing. So don't let it, don't get twisted around an axle over stuff. Just keep working the problem and working around it. And I think you'll do very well. Thanks. Um, yeah. So you, Grace mentions, um, being the only woman in the room, um, a lot of times, uh, especially started when you were starting out your career. So Carolyn, the next question is for you. Why is it important to have women at the table um, and having them contributing to influential conversations within organizations? Well, the first thing is that women are about relationships and the success in transportation, I think is around relationships. Um, uh, relationships with your customers, relationships with your stakeholders, relationships with your team. Um, that is the key to the success. But also, um, there's a different voice in the room when a woman is there. It's about the value of diversity. And it's a diversity of experience, a diversity of knowledge, diversity of perspective, a diversity of approach. And it's a different dimension and inclusion of those voices in the room. And it provides an opportunity for advocacy for women at all levels of the organization by increasing their visibility and, and providing opportunities for them. Um, you know, we're able to provide input, advice, and guidance, like Grace was talking about, someone putting an elbow or trying to, you know, push you out of the room. I, I've had experiences where I, I have said my voice wasn't heard, and I had to make a decision about whether I wanted to be there, stay there, or go somewhere else. And I think that's one thing that women have to really acknowledge is what time it is, and is it your season, and is this the place for you to be? But I think that, um, you know, what we've seen um, in, in analysis and in uh, reports is that 
uh, studies about women actually being at the table, especially in corporations and in boardrooms, is that, that the companies are more profitable. But you know, in terms of public transportation, we're not for profit, but we are delivering an essential service. And the voice of women in the decisions around what is happening in their community is essential. And so I think it's extremely important that um, women are there and that their voices are heard and that we're actually influencing the decision with our perspective. Thank you. I think it also helps, um, we, we bring that well-rounded practical, life practicalness to the decision-making. Um, I can remember being on a call during the middle of COVID and we were talking about shifting routes and making adjustments to routes. And someone literally, a female literally brought up, it's the first of the month. We can't, we have to make sure that we have enough coverage because folks get their checks on the first of the month. You know, the shop, grocery shopping happens, the medicine happens, all the things that happens on the first of the month. And, you know, I think most of the men on the call hadn't thought about it being the first of the month and the grocery shopping that needs to occur at the first of the month. And, and that's so it's about perspective and accountability. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think from a practical perspective, you know, bringing it down to like how it operationalizes, um, it's, it's in that, that level of detail that we bring that what happens in our own households to work sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely good to have those perspectives in there. Um, I'm gonna shift directions a little bit and talk a little bit more about our, the career path. So um, this is something I'm interested in as a young professional who pretty much pretty recently got into transportation. Um, so Lona, you mentioned starting your career off at a refinery. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about what led you into transit? I know you got here recently, um, but how, how did you get here and what connections have you made from changing industries? Yeah, so, you know, at the refinery, um, I spent almost 18 years and I had a relatively well-rounded background at the refinery. So I worked projects, I worked maintenance, I worked inspection um, and had, you know, bounced around little projects um, and large projects. Um, but then, um, and personally, I was an outspoken school board critic. So I'd go to school board meetings and complain about what was or was not happening um, and the conditions of the facilities um, always just really bugged me. And then Katrina hit. And, you know, the story, you know, sitting, I remember sitting in an engineering firm's um, office um, in Baton Rouge because we couldn't get back down and, and making a comment to a colleague that uh, saying, once I get the refinery back up and running, I'm going to help rebuild the city because never on my watch will, you know, projects just not get done or folks just put money in their pockets and leave the citizens behind. Um, I wanted to either come back and rebuild hospitals or schools. I didn't know what it was, but it was going to be for the public good. And then, you know, two years later, there was a job ad for the recovery school district looking for um, a capital projects director. And they had just appointed the super, the state's new state superintendent. And so I literally stalked him for about nine months until he hired me. And there would be an article in the newspaper that summer about putting up module, modulars and some problem with the construction. And I sent him an email saying, hey, coach, put me in. I can help you out. I don't know much about, you know, this FEMA thing, but I could put you in. I mean, you know, I, I know I can figure it out. And, you know, I guess he said, this lady's really crazy, but she's not going away. Let me just hire her. And so I ultimately got hired and stayed at the school system for about 11 years and, um, you know, helped negotiate the largest FEMA PW um, uh, that was ever written at the time, um, demolish 
a ton of old buildings that needed to be demolished, rebuilt uh, probably 48 um, new, new and renovated buildings, but um, got to really see teachers and children, you know, in awe of like being able to walk into New Orleans buildings and teachers say, wait, I feel like I'm in another city. This doesn't feel like New Orleans, particularly the teachers who had worked here before. Um, that was probably some of the most re rewarding uh, and community members, right? Who would say, um, I don't, I never got the input, not uh, the ability to uh, participate in a building process. No one ever asked me um, how a building should look in my neighborhood or where the trash should, trash dumpsters should be in my neighborhood um, that I was never a, a given in, input. So that taught me a lot. And then um, new mayor got elected and um, I was recruited by a private consultant um, to come do some uh, potential program management for the FEMA roads program. Well, the mayor decided and the city administration decided to go in a different direction. And so um, uh, I was asked to participate and come to RTA board meetings as a potential, you know, figuring out if there was work to be had. And I started coming to the actual board meetings, not the committee meetings, but the board meetings. And then hearing um, community members, I'll never forget this one community member who talked about the wait time to go from um, New Orleans East to Metairie and how long it, how, how early in the morning he had to get up to get to work at a particular time. And at the time I was training for a, a 70.3 triathlon. And I kept saying, man, I could ride my bike for that distance in the time, you know, he's talking about in less time, he's talking about taking, you know, the bus. And that stuck with me. And then um, fast forward, you know, a few months, Alex gets hired and he's at a, a, a breakfast meeting and he mentioned needing, you know, a PE to manage his capital projects. And I just kept saying, I don't think you need a PE. You just need an engineer that knows how to ask the right questions um, because you're not designing anything. You know, if you only, only need a PE if you're actually going to do the designs and have to do the stamps. So, of course, I did a loan and was bold, bold enough to tell him what he needed. And so, you know, I've been here since then, and it's been a pretty amazing process um, converting, going from, you know, helping to convert the contract employees to full-time employees um, and helping to rebuild work processes because that's what the refinery was ton of work processes. So learning, bringing that skills and then the, the, the ability to, um, with the FEMA and all of it, results to figuring out your passion. And for me, it was being passionate about helping people and helping the children of New Orleans live a better life. So that's how I got to transit and that's why I'm enjoying it. Well, we are so glad to have you here and we're very lucky. We have a lot of work to do, at, as you said, this um, bringing everybody in house, uh, it's crazy. There's a lot going on here. Um, so uh, glad you got your foot in the door. Um, my next question is for Grace. Um, so as a leader of an agency, um, how do you build a culture that prioritizes equity um, and especially one, a culture that sustains at that agency after you leave? Um, you have to articulate what your values are and you have to articulate and find in the agency you're working for what their values are when you get there. And if they need to be shifted or if they're hollow, they say they're this, but that you, you know, they're not living up to it. Uh, you need to implement that. Um, tr treating people fairly and helping people that um, don't have as much or have been stepped on in the past or not listened to um, is something that uh, I care about. Um, 
and it gets articulated in different ways. But as a leader, you have to find the right way to say what the agency needs to hear where their head's at. It, when you come in as a manager to any agency, general manager, let's use that as an example, you do have to assess where people are for, on whatever the topic is. So asset management is a big passion of mine, okay? So is equity. What we call equity today, what we called racial justice before women's you know, equality, that sort of thing. But treating, making sure there's an opportunity for everybody both in terms of the community members and what they have to give input and that their input counts and that your employees and the contractors that you have, uh, you know, women and minority contractors that, that feel like they can participate LGBTQ as well. Um, and in San Francisco, we put in some policies uh, that, that helped in that regard as well. So you, you articulate it at the top and then you make sure your managers are there and following you and not undercutting you in any way. And if they are undercutting you in any way, you get rid of them, okay? Or you, you make it clear that part of their evaluation is that they're gonna get there. They're gonna get the whole team there. Um, and, and most people turn around. You don't have to fire most people. You can usually get their attention. Um, but, uh, and get your employees working for you. You change the policies. You, may, you go through the policies and make sure there's, you make sure you have programs in place that help people get there. Because when you're doing cultural change of any kind, people need help. You need to tell them and train them. At BART, we created a leadership uh, academy and the leadership academy took mostly uh, uh, women and minorities, uh, people of color, and uh, gave them a training program that explained the budget process, that explained some of the basics in management, that explained project management. Uh, what, what Lona talked about mostly was project management. She's a project manager and she's pivoted her career with project management and, and given it, you know, she's actively gone out and stalked people to get the job she wants because she has the passion for those things. In, in terms of, you know, employment inside an agency, if you have the same passion as what's being advocated for, there are committees that are set up and join those committees, put in the extra work and it is extra work, but you, you have to have programs, policies, you gotta make sure your board is there. If you're all for equity and they're not, you're up a creek. I mean, it's going to be hard. You can do a lot, but it's hard to get things through. So it's the same thing with implementing any program, whether it's asset management or whether it's a new capital program, you've got to stay on it, manage it, kick the tires, check with the employees, make sure it's really done. You get the best information from the station agents and from the drivers when you sit down or the train operators, when you get a few minutes away from anyone else and you can just listen to what they're saying and ask if it's all a contradiction, if what you say at the top isn't getting through, isn't implemented, isn't following through. Um, but it's a complete, it takes a long time. Cultural change takes a long time. And uh, the two other women here, I'm just gonna guess have been at this for a while as well. And the cultural change, no matter what community you're in, takes a lot of effort. So as you're, when you start out in a career, you, you're, you know, two years at this position, two years at that, and you kind of move around. But the further along you get, you know, you should be there three to five years. And even in five years, I was at one agency for eight and another agency for eight. It, it, it took about that long to get really significant changes um, through to the, um, um, to the agency and to, to, to leave in, in place something that helps people um, make those changes over time and, and continue the work. Right. Yeah. The lasting, the lasting effects of you being at the agency, that's something that um, actually Alex and Catherine both mentioned about, um, about the culture that you built. Um, and so we wanted to ask you about that. Um, okay. Great. So my next question is uh, going to be for Carolyn. Um, and this is, yeah, so what were some successes and defeats that you took away early in your career and carried with you? Well, I, I'd like to change the word, like Grace said earlier when you asked her a question about challenges. Um, the defeats weren't really what I call something that uh, were showstoppers it really was about diversions and distractions um, from my level of passion or courage. And, and in the end, I think my passion and courage overcame what were you know, attempts, I would say, uh, to change my course, which didn't happen. Um, you know, I've had to deal with, I call the boys club in the ranks, um, you know, with their attempts to exclude me physically 
from the room and my voice from the room. Um, you know, I've had I've had males come in and I'm I'm the decision maker, and they're they're coming into the room and talking over me or around me to my male subordinates like they were going to make the decision. And I had to make it clear in the end, the decision lies with me, not with the guy you're talking to. And um, so, you know, I, I've had like early in my career when I got out of college, I was working in a manufacturing plant, which was like, there were only two professional males in the, I mean, two professional females in the plant. You know, the guys would be in the room smoking cigars, trying to, you know, I say smoke us out of the room, basically make us feel uncomfortable and, and, you know, making comments and about, you know, our performance and, and just overall inappropriate stuff. And, you know, in the end, it's about persevering and not letting that stop you. Um, and, you know, I think many of the, the, the challenges that we all face in, in business is really reconciling different styles. And, um, you know, I, I had some patronizing male managers. I'm going to help you. I'm going to make sure you get this done my way. Um, and, you know, I just, just said, you know, this is not supportive and I'm going to, you know, try to do it my way as Alex gave an example of my fight for, uh, you know, the way that we administered law enforcement in at LA Metro was one of those where it, 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 it was like falling on the sword because this is the way that I thought that it should be done. And, you know, I think the success is really is learning how to balance those expectations and reality and um, not being afraid to tell the truth or what you think like Lona was uh, doing. I mean, she was displaying her passion and manifesting the direction that she thinks that things should be done and she was successful. But you, you have to really assess the truth about the situation. And, um, and then, you know, having confidence in yourself, uh, proving yourself. And as I said, knowing when it's time to leave and, and not being afraid to do so. Um, I like Grace, I've had to relocate to different cities. And it's, um, it's about pursuing what you think is best and pursuing what you think is, is going to be the best for your community and the best for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we definitely owe it, the rest of us owe it to women like you for persevering <laughs> to actually make that path easier because they don't literally smoke us out of the room anymore. Um, so. <laughs> I hope that, yeah, have you noticed things getting easier? Have you noticed your path easing as you get more experienced and as like culture changes? Um, there's more women in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just wanna take people, go ahead, Lana, you go. No, I was, I was gonna ask both of you, um, kind of the, what was fascinating is the the fact that the the multiple generations and how things and the the different locations and how things really aren't that different. But what I am noticing is the younger women's voice is a little bit different than maybe our voice. I know my voice was when I walked into the refinery in 1988 and or my first internship and was offered some chewing tobacco because they were trying to figure out how I was going to react to that level of, you know, patronage. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious, like, um, how explicit or how brutally honest you had to be to overcome some of those situations, um, or what were you able to just handle it in a in a different way in a deflection type way well uh, as as general manager at bart the head of operations when i got there uh 
basically said, sat me down and said, um, here's how we do things. And I said, you know, great, that's great. And I started asking some questions and uh, was told that that's not the way we do things. <clears throat> um, and so uh, over the course, uh, a, a great guy, smart man, knows his stuff. Um, but uh, Bart was, um, uh, Bart always thought of itself as a young agency. And they were operating about 45 years when I showed up. Okay, 40, 45, I forget, we had some anniversary. And the infrastructure was showing its age and they weren't paying attention to that. And not one person there in the executive management, there was one guy who was in charge of asset management who knew what was going on, but not one person there when they listed the top three problems said we need to re, uh, you know, we, we've got to refresh the infrastructure and worry about a uh, state of good repair. And when I looked, as I said, when you come on these jobs, you have to do a survey. So I had to take this agency and the board. There wasn't one board member that thought this was a high priority. But when I looked at BART, they were just aging off a cliff and they were going to fall in and not be. Everyone wants to build the next line. They wanted to do it at BART. Everyone's excited about the ribbon cutting. No one says, hey, let's redo that substation, huh? The power station. Um, I'm not talking about where the customers are. I'm talking about the real infrastructure that nobody sees, which you know well, Lona, if you know refineries. So um, I had to be the one that sobered all these people up. And my operations person was, you know, like, yeah, yeah. You know, and at some point I whip out this chart after I'd said, we, here's where we're headed, you know? And he said, well, you know, and he started through his thing and I held up the chart and I said, as it turns out, <laughs> The person up here at the top is me and you're down here and this is a direct order. Do you understand that? And he's a very smart, good guy. And he's like, all right, I get it. You know, I get it. Now he did get it that day, but I've pulled out that chart at least four times in the eight years I was at Bard to say to this guy, get with a program, damn it. We're moving in this direction. So you have to, and it was a lot of, this is, you know, I, I doubt that he would have done that to a male general manager. Okay. Um, and so you're tested all the time. It doesn't get any easier. You have to find a style that confronts uh, the situation. And in some cases, you can think about it the next day. In some cases, you have to have your wits about you and you need to stand your ground right there. It just depends. And you'll make some mistakes. I did, you know, along the way, whether I popped off too soon or whether I waited, you know, and should have gone in there. But you develop a style. Um, you have to have respect for the organization. You're there. You're not the smartest person in the room every time. So you think that stuff through and you pick your battles too, the way you do in anything in life. Um, but I think uh, courage, smarts, tenacity, um, you know, humility um, all play a role in that. And I, I, I have one little story I want to tell folks just to give you some perspective. When I went, when I was volunteering in the mayor's office, <clears throat> I was told the story of, uh, someone, so this is the early seven, mid seventies and the, it's the mid seventies. And in the early seventies is when they let women into the maintenance department. And so for the first time, women were doing physical labor there in any kind of numbers. So they had a room and <clears throat> there were two incidents that were recounted to me. So these weren't more than two years old at the time. One is during hunting season, the women came into the locker room and there was this deer's head that had been slashed open and there were uh, and left there and, and uh, blood was all over the, the um, uh, room. And the other time they came in and defecated, you know, all over the locker room, not in the stalls, but all over the locker room, you know, just to kind of make a point that this is, you know, you're not really welcome here. And so that when you're, we're all talking about ladies in the boardroom kind of stuff and office stuff, but when you're out on the line or you're out there on the bus by yourself out there, it's a whole different world. And it takes a pretty tough broad to make their way through some of the physical intimidation, you know, real abuse that goes on out there. And it's just a lighter version in the boardroom and it's still out there. We, we've seen that, you know, the resurgence of it. And so you got to keep your wits about you and also keep your ethics about you and and find a way to, to work through those problems still today. Yep, there's overt and covert harassment and it still is out there. Yeah, thank you for telling that story. That's, that's a good reminder um, that there are women always fighting to, to uh, have what is rightfully theirs um, on all levels of the 
corporate ladder or um, org in chart. other industries, org chart. Yeah, that's it. Uh, um, so <laughs> that kind of, uh, my next question is sort of um, maybe something that can be used as a weapon in that way. Um, but people always ask about, uh, they never ask men this, but they ask women about work-life balance. And um, Lona, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you've um, how you've maintained work-life balance and had a family and still uh, maintain your career trajectory. So, yeah. I remember um, when I decided that it was time to become a mom, um, going to my um, then manager and saying, hey, can you move me into the planning department because we're getting ready to plan for a turnaround where they you know, take the entire refinery down. And so during this nine month period, I would not necessarily have to go out into the field, but I can be in an office setting. And this guy then, instead of moving me into the planning department, moved me into inspection where I was forced to go into the field. So I moved into inspection and then quickly got a doctor's note um, saying I could not. So he essentially had an employee he couldn't use for those nine months. Um, so they had to figure out how to, you know, figure uh, do roles for me in the inspection um, department. But ultimately I landed in back in the capital projects department and did um, cost engineering for about eight years while I was, I'm pregnant and that allowed me the opportunity to really see how the back office ran. Um, so I got to understand how accounting work run, the scheduling. I worked on an uh, IT project um, where we converted software, um, the, uh, the maintenance management system. Um, so, and that took me off of call work. So I wasn't having to respond to emergency at night or fires or any of that sort of thing and gave me the opportunity to really, um, while, while my children were itty bitties, to um, take care of them. Um, but I say we can have it all, but possibly not all at the same time. Um, as, and, and it's ebbs and flow. And today, I guess with technology, it makes it a lot easier because you can bring your laptop home. I remember when I was working at the schools, um, I would people would say I, they could tell my time frame because I'd leave work at 4.30 um, to pick up the kids in aftercare and help them do their soccer or what have you. And then we do um, homework and baths. And then by about 7.30, they'd see the emails flying again because the kids would have wind down. My daughter had figured out that she can come plop in my bed and do homework in, while she was in middle school. Um, the, I think the hardest challenge for me was when they were young and parents. So taking care of parents and um, children around the same time and work. Um, I think it's also important with um, a mate that possibly you both are not on rising tracks at the same time. I've talked to other couples who possibly um, sw switch jobs. Each person, if, they, if they're a mobile couple, the move, one move is based on one couple and then the next move, the other, the other person gets to, you know, Put their career first for a period of time so it's just really a balance like with anything even your health right you know you eat right sleep right but you know when you're out of sync and then your career is more of a cha-cha you don't always go up sometimes you go side to side <laughs> um i think at one point when um my last one was born again i said okay it's time i got to see I'm highly competitive, but there were a couple of guys who I graduated from, from college with who were at the refinery or we all started the refinery together. And I got to see them moving up and it was like, oh no, they, they are not gonna surpass me. And so it was like, okay, it's time to get back in the game. And then I, you know, 
I said, I need, I need to get back in the game. I can't let these guys pass me. But the other thing I, I wanted, I was thinking about this um, this morning. Um, I heard someone recently say, comparison is the thief of joy. And I know at certain ages, we are so hung up on the, the comparison piece that it's, it, we're, we're struggling to keep up and it just takes away from the joy of living at that moment because we're always comparing ourselves to other people. So the work-life life balance is a challenge, but I, for whatever reason, always figured out how to put the kids first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Grace or Carolyn, do you have work-life balance advice? I never had balance. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I let work consume me so so I, I'm I'm but I, I do have to um, affirm what Lona said about seasons um, I, I, I think you can't sustain that same level of intensity at all times and there there are some times where you have to step aside in my case, uh, you know, was a concern about my parents. And, um, you know, I, I was living back east and moved back west again uh, to Los Angeles because I felt that I needed to be near them. Um, but, you know, luckily I had a sister who was contributing, but, but at some point in your time, there, there are different seasons and you have to address the priority for that season. Um, but, you know, continue the focus in my case on my career that I was able to do it because I had the support of the family. So mm -hmm. that's I, good advice for anyone. Yeah. I, uh, I adopted two kids as a single person um, and stayed single. Um, and it was, um, I, I'm with Lona, it's the kids have to come first. Um, that's what you see, I think, during COVID. You see people quitting their jobs because they've got to make sure the kids are okay. And the kids aren't okay. I mean, it, it, none of us are okay. You can have two well-employed, whatever. And with COVID, the whole world has been turned upside down. The structures, everybody knew, especially for kids, it's rough. Um, and so I, I think you have to take care of those first. I think as a country, we're going to have a big, difficult time getting back because it's that competitiveness uh, with I'm with Lona you you you're you're looking over your shoulders and you're watching you know where you stand but then you have to judge and and make sure that you're taking care of number one and number one of the kids from my point of view um so I I jumped off the um <clears throat> rat race in DC and came out west because it's easier to raise kids in the west you people expect you to have a life in the west and in dc they don't and so it's the seasons carolyn was talking about somewhat and so i left there and took a job in oregon from oregon's point of view the head of the department of transportation is an all-consuming job but compared to washington i never never told him this but compared to washington dc you know it was a cakewalk um because they don't expect you to be there until 10 o'clock at night, you can be home, you know, you can read your stuff and everything else at night after the kids go to bed, as Lona said, and I did that for a very long time. It's not easy. My kids got the chicken pox just as the budget was coming up for the first time. Um, uh, uh, we had our appropriations budget. And so I went to the chairman of the committee and I said, my kids have chicken pox. I don't have anybody else that can be home with them. And he's a grand, he was a grandfather and I, I his receptionist was his wife at the state legislature. And I went to her and I said, I need to talk to your husband. I'm sorry for the short notice, but I'm supposed to be up, you know, later this week to do my budget. And she said, what's the problem? And I said, my kids just got the chicken pox. One of them has it and I know the other one will get it. Uh, so this is going to be an extended, you know, two week period or whatever. And I said, I, there isn't a substitute to me. And she said, well, just a minute. So she goes in and talks to him. These are grandparents, right? He said, Grace, what can I do for you? Um, and I explained the problem. He said, well, I think I'll just call the parks department and I think their budget's gonna be up on Thursday instead of yours. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. You let us know, you know. Now he could have screwed me over. He didn't have to do that. Um, he screwed over the parks guy, believe me, because you know, advancing your budget presentation is a very big deal. Um, but he kept rolling and, and I, I dealt with the reality. It's the keeping it real part that I think wasn't mentioned directly like that, but Lona earlier in the 
presentation said it, women, or maybe it was Carolyn, but you women keep it real. They they're worried about, you know, the first of the month, it was Lona, you know, it's, it's keeping it real. And you try that Avenue first. I might've been able to con somebody to come down from Portland to stay, but Portland's 50 miles away. Um, and it's a rough duty, you know, so um, an adoption of two kids isn't easy, but I did it at the same time I was a director of transportation in Oregon. And for me, a perspective was that West Coast, it's easier. People expect you to have a life and, and you make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, those, are, yeah, this is, this has been really great. Um, I actually, I have just one more question and you guys have kind of talked about it already. Um, but maybe you have some more stories. Um, being a woman in a predominantly male driven field, have you experienced discrimination? Um, and what advice, how did you address it? And what advice would you uh, leave us with for dealing with that? <laughs> it's easy. Yes. <laughs> yes, we, we have experienced <laughs> gender. And, and in my case, racial discrimination in, in, in decisions that have been made about my career. So, um, you know, uh, the, the word that, um, that has been used today is persevere. Um, it's, it's really not letting those things stop you. Um, and, and, you know, the conditions uh, that that come out of that is really um, a decision about the values of that in, of that organization and whether or not they actually support equity and um, and so you know had to make decisions around around that and you know and and but I think in the end it's really about the confidence in your own mobility and capabilities. Um, and being able to show that you can do those jobs and that you can do them better. And, and, and that's what women always have to do is, is they've, they've been tasked with doing it better. So, <laughs> but I think it's important that you have your own kitchen cabinet, you have your own network, you have your, you know, you, you seek mentors and advocates and sponsors because the one thing that women normally do not have is someone to tell their story and support them. And I think that's one of the things that I love about Grace is that, you know, she's had the courage to tell the story. And, you know, her book is, has been really important to a lot of women in the industry in basically showing that there are women out there who have done it and who have had the courage. Carolyn, you would have been in the book, but you were at the FTA and they would, you wouldn't let us put you in the book because of the, your political stuff. So sorry. I mean, they wouldn't let you, whatever. Anyway. I still love your book. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I think Lona, if she was out in refinery work, has had the toughest climb of all mm -hmm. um, of the folks that are here. And you just, we, we're dealt who we are. I'm not, I'm not gonna abandon my gender, I'm happy. I'm happy as a woman, right? Um, I use the she pronoun and you know, we're, um, we are where we are, but you can provide avenues for everyone else and you can sort of, uh, what, when people say, when you're in closed settings and someone says, well, I, I'm not sure if we're ready for a fill in the blank, you know, um, back in 2000, there's a state dot uh, meet a meeting that was held about a state hiring a state dot head, and the the phrase that was used in the room in 2000. I'm not sure we're ready for a Jewish person in this position. Now, um, I won't name the state, but give me a break. You know what does your religion have to do with your ability to manage a state agency, right? So stuff's still going on in every quarter, and it's important for me to stand up for religion, for me to stand up for race, for me to stand up for LGBTQ folks, for me to stand up for people from the East Coast, we can handle them in the West Coast, okay? You know, I mean, whatever the, all you're doing is limiting yourself and limiting your organization 
if you hear people say something else and it takes courage, but we need to keep the doors open for everybody to compete so that we are serving everybody and so that we have the best talent here. And you, you will find, you know, I'm sure if my career lasted another 50 years, we'd still be dealing with some of these issues and you just have to deal with them outright as best you can and out them and, and you know, say, what, you know, why are, why are we talking about this? Is the guy got a degree? Does he have management experience? You know, I mean, back to this other situation. It was a man, it wasn't a woman, so. And uh, Carolyn just wrote it in the chat, but Grace, what is the name of your book? Boots on the Ground, Flats in the Boardroom. And it's, it's stories of, of uh, I think 16 or 18 women all from around the country uh, in transportation. And this is just, it, it's their career. And it, it shows, um, it's, it's not uh, my stories in there, but what's really important is there, particularly the women of color that are in the book, there's four or five of them, um, their story about how they made it up and, and how they had to, you know, the, what they went through um, would, would give anyone some, some paths to follow. So that's, and there, it's very readable. It's just, you know, 13, 20 pages a person. So it, you can capture folks and it's real easy to use. It's, it's, Leona will be in the next book and so will Carolyn. <laughs> Mona. No, I'll say this about discrimination. I guess I've just used it as fuel to, to prove that I'm, 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 I can. And, and I guess part of it is how I was raised. I was raised with, <clears throat> with playing football with the boys on the playground and was better than a good chunk of them. So, you know, coming into the refinery and having a guy haze me or tell me what I couldn't climb the ladder or whatever it was. It was like, I'm going to show you, I can do it just as well as you can. Um, so I think one of the things that I've learned throughout the process of the 30 years of working and most recently the last, you know, 15 or so is finding your passion and using your skills to pursue that passion. Um, and for me, it's been making sure the citizens of New Orleans, the least get the most and, and it's that equity, ec the pursuit of equity. Um, and so that's what has me, I guess, waking up, putting my feet on the ground so that the devil says, oh gosh, she's up, she's up again. She's, <laughs> you know, here she goes. And so I'm going to leave that as my closing remark. And so, you know, make sure that every day we are, we are moving forward for our riders and doing the best we can so that they can, you know, make their day a little bit easier. So if anybody else would like to um, make a closing remark about your, you know, journey in, in transit and, you know, your pursuit, um, I'd love to hear your closing remarks. I, I think that um, what you have, talked about today uh, is really about manifesting your destiny, uh, telling people what you want, telling people about your passion and actualizing that passion. And um, it is something that I think all of us have talked about today. And, um, and so I, I, I just encourage um, the women who are listening, uh, the women who are coming up uh, and thinking about their careers uh, to really think about transportation as, as, as an option. Uh, there are really a diverse number of jobs that are in transportation. And I think, you know, you have, you have seen from our panelists and our moderator that, uh, you know, we all have come up different pathways in our career, um, but there is uh, you know, there is fulfillment in being able to provide essential services and to improve your community. So those are my closing remarks. <laughs> I worked at the local, state, and federal levels uh, of government and transit districts, special districts. And uh, I was doing what Leona, what Lona said, and that's following my passion. I, I did stuff I liked. And if you're doing stuff you like and that challenges you, and I like a good problem, I like to keep working on problems. 
Um, if you're doing that, you really don't work a day of your life. You know, you're doing what you like and you're thinking about that. You try and make the kids think you're thinking about them. You know, you love people and you're there for your parents and all that stuff. But really, you're mulling over these problems, you know, and having a good time at it. And um, in transportation, what Carolyn said is so true. Lawyers, uh, you know, project management, if you're a human resources oriented person, if you're an accounting nerd, if you're a math wizard, you know, or you just like work and hard work, um, all of those are open to people in transportation. So I, I, I didn't, I, I had a political science and um, criminal justice undergraduate degree and my master's was in business and it just equipped me to, I followed the money, if you will. I, I raised money for local governments. I handled money in the appropriation staff. That's where I was, a, uh, that was my staff job. And I did money and, um, and policy at the U.S. Department of Transportation. So you, you just um, find something you're good at and then you pivot occasionally uh, to find the next thing and the next adventure kind of around the corner. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, this has been really fun and it is, uh, we're at time. So um, hope to see you again in the future. Thanks, thank Elizabeth. You. And thanks, thanks Alex, for hosting us. Yes. Thank you, guys.